Hi, and welcome to Axel Bank Reports History and Today Conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with Harold Holzer, the author of Brought Forth on This Continent Abraham Lincoln and American Immigration. He's written one quarter of all the books ever written about Lincoln. No, I'm just kidding. Um, But uh, according to my calculations, he's written or contributed mightily to over 50 books. I think it says 56 um, in uh, the acknowledgments of this book. It's an unbelievable number. Um, And that still doesn't do justice to the contributions you've made to Lincolnia. Uh, Harold, you were on the 29th episode of this show in December of 2020. And here you are on the 147th episode. It's great to have you back. Thank you, Evan. It took you long enough to have me back. I had to write another <laughs> book. To right, get- yeah, right. You got to keep writing books. I'll keep having right. you. Um, before we start our interview, I want to invite listeners to our Patreon to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity that supports children's literacy. The story that is commonly told about when Abraham Lincoln first encountered a slave is that he was in his late teens and working in New Orleans, the first time he ever saw a slave. Now, by the time he was deep in his presidency, he would, of course, develop firm opinions about the future of slavery. But by 1864, he also had developed firm opinions about the benefit of being a nation influenced by immigrants. They could replenish our nation, he said. First of all, though, Harold, when uh, when is he likely to have first encountered an immigrant. We know the story about when he first encountered a slave. When would he have first seen an immigrant? Let me just impose, because I'm going to be school marmish, but I think in New Orleans as a teenager, (laughs) he first encountered a slave auction. Ah, okay. He had seen enslaved people in in Kentucky and also on the Indiana roads, because they could bring slaves through free states in those days. But interestingly... I should have left well enough alone. It was in the very same city and the very same trip. At least that's the first time he saw people who spoke foreign languages because New Orleans was such a cosmopolitan city. He heard French spoken. He saw Haitian people. And I think he first became aware of, you know, the American potential for being multi-ethnic on that, on that same trip. And then um, I don't think it really hit him as a factor in his own life and in his political and government life until, you know, the, the, the late mid to late 1840s when the Irish uh, began moving into Springfield, Illinois and Germans began moving into Illinois. And then he came face to face with immigrants and immigration really for the first, first time. Where are his first recordings of what, I mean, do we know at one point he starts to reflect on this idea that America could be a place where lots of people from lots of different places live, including new ones. I think we have his first recorded important reflection in 1844. So he would have been 35 years old. He's a member of the Whig Party. And I'm sure he would much have preferred not to give any thought to immigrants or immigration. I mean, his view of uh, the Irish at that point is that they're joining the Democratic Party. And he wants, you know, he doesn't regard them as potential allies or friends. In fact, he has kind of a uh, employer-employee relationship with the only Irish people he knows. And those are the uh, the servants who his wife hires um, to, to work domestically in the house and reportedly slaps around a few times. But that's, so in 1844, there's a big anti-Irish Catholic riot in Philadelphia. In fact, there are two of them in in the spring and the summer. And it's pretty ugly. Churches are burned. Holy books are destroyed. It's a battle over what prayer to read in the morning in schools. It's it's just, but it it reflects built up resentment. So Americans, and we're going to get to all the different politics and the resentments that develop, but Americans, even ones who are interested in history, could certainly have the impression based on the way history is told that immigration really doesn't start bubbling up and impacting America until the late 1800s and early 1900s when Ellis Island becomes a big part of the story. Um, the impression mm-hmm. might be that the found, that after the founders and the slaves got here or were brought here, 
American def- demographics were sort of frozen, right, between the founding and then the late 1800s. That's at least an impression one could have. What is the reality of what immigration was like after the founding and then as Lincoln is growing up in the 1810s, 20s, and 30s? So uh, there is some immigration, both Washington and Jefferson, before they were burdened with the Irish, um, had um, um, encouraged Europeans to move to the United States because it was a vast country, even at 13 colonies, and needed farming and needed workers. And so they hoped that new new citizens could arrive from overseas. Now, Adams became disenchanted with immigrants because they tended to support the the Democratic Republicans. This is John Adams, not Quincy. Yeah, not the Federalists. So he signed the Alien and Sedition Act, which allowed uh, the president to deport anyone who was, you know, contradicted the president, basically. And they changed the residency requirement for citizenship from five years to 14 years. Then Adams leaves, the, the bill sunsets, nobody tries to pass it. But think of it, for the whole early period before Ellis Island, um, which is a late 19th century institution where my grandparents came through, um, all you had to do is kind of just afford to book passage. You set foot in one of the major landing stations. New York got 70% of the immigrants or Philadelphia or Boston. You registered somewhere that you're here. Presumably the people who came had relatives or had made arrangements at boarding houses, whatever. They got jobs. Five years later, they could become citizens. No questions asked, no no walls, no razor wire, um, no ice. Uh, just saying it was open, open borders, really. And what did that right of citizenship get them? The right to vote, the right, the right to, to own vote. property? Is that That's the main thing. All um, of the what... above, and the right to vote primarily. And of course, there is a, a movement developing to oppose that. And Lincoln's own party of the 1830s and 40s, the Whigs, were not sympathetic to immigrants because, as they say, just on political grounds, they tended to align themselves with, until the eighteen late 1840s, with Democrats because they were all Catholic and the Democrats welcomed them. There is so much coverage today of the impact of immigration, both in local media, national media, print media, broadcast media, digital media. What was the view of the media and how much did the media of the day cover immigration in you know Lincoln's early adulthood? Well, they began covering it in the 1840s when the Irish potato famine drove you know hundreds of thousands of impoverished Irish to the United States really in in search of nourishment and opportunity so that that does bring us back to 1844 so these riots are taking place in Philadelphia and Whigs around the country have to sort of acknowledge that this was a terrible thing and defend immigration to the best of their ability. And Lincoln goes to a big meeting in Springfield in 44, a Whig party mini convention. And he writes his first resolutions saying that nothing should be put in the way of people trying to enter the country. The only thing he suggested might be imposed is they should learn something about America. Mm-hmm. Other than that, he was pretty open about it for 1844. Was there anything specific that he felt they should learn about America? It's history. It's customs. He was pretty vague. So that's where it lay for him for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. He had made the statement and then, you know, nativism arises and pushes back against the masses of Irish immigration and pushes back against the German immigration that started in 48. How does his professional life, life as an attorney, life, I believe he was a postmaster, Um, He had kind of a number of odd jobs, right? He ran a general store in his early adulthood. How did his professional life bring him into touch with immigrants, out of touch with immigrants? And what was the relationship like as he gets to know these folks? Baking from our childhood just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell slice, flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. (laughs) Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. 
Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from The Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. It's kind of remarkable, but in his early life, the storekeeper, postmaster, militiaman life, he really didn't know any immigrants. New Salem was a pretty one-dimensional town in terms of, of uh, diversity. It's only in Springfield, um, where he moves in the early 40s, that he meets people from other cultures and countries. I mean, there's a little Black population in Springfield, and increasingly Irish and German. So that's where he begins to see diversity uh, for the for the first time. And he reacts kind of the way most um, people do who've been who's been in the country for generations with a little bit of suspicion um, and um, a little bit of uh, high handedness, especially when there's a political divide. And when the German Protestants start coming in 48 and 49 and they're interested in, in the Whig and later the Republican Party and they're interested in anti-slavery. Then he really makes friends and, and allies. And he starts um, to, I believe, have campaign leaflets printed in German. And he Absolutely. makes a real effort to reach out to them. What does that say about his political touch and political awareness? Well, he has to prove himself over and over again because there are always suspicions that he's a nativist at heart, at least, you know, through the 1840s and, and through the 1850s. So he has to defend himself from time to time. He also wants nativists to join the Republican Party and join the anti-slavery movement. So at the same time, he's denouncing nativism. He's cozying up to nativists. But there are a lot of future Republican anti-slavery people who were cozy with nativists in the 1850s. It's What it says about him is that he's feeling his way, I think. I know it's a corny word these days, but in the same way he's evolving on slavery and and human rights, He's evolving on immigration. In the um, in the in the nineties, um, in particular, there was a lot of talk about whether there should be a bilingual education, whether that would be appropriate. Did that kind of jargon ever enter the lexicon back then? Should we be teaching kids, let's say, in German and in English in school, right. or in Creole, maybe in the South? How much of uh, chatter was there? Can we compare, in other words? The, the issues that we grew up with, that I grew up with, at least, versus what he was dealing with. Yeah, I would say there was a, a separate German language movement. And what did Lincoln do? He embraced it fully because in 1859, the year after he loses the Senate to Stephen Douglas, the year before he contends for the presidency, he actually invests in and kind of takes control over a German language newspaper in Springfield, Illinois. Um, he's the secret publisher of the Illinois Stats Anzeiger, and um, he gives five hundred dollars to this German publisher who who didn't make a go of it in Southern Illinois, and the pub the paper publishes through eighteen sixty, and the campaign supporting Lincoln. So he's very involved in German language politics and publishing. You know the poor guy even took German lessons in Springfield because he really wanted to speak in German. To the Germans, you know, we've had a few politicians in the, this country who've spoken Spanish. I know our own Mayor Bloomberg here in New York City. Sure, Jeb Bush does. Rick Scott Bush. does. Yeah, yeah. Jeb Bush speaks good Spanish. Bloomberg spoke terrible Spanish. Right. He took he relentlessly took lessons, and he spoke Spanish with a uh, New York accent. But uh, uh, so Lincoln never learned because, according to his friends, he spent the whole time in class cracking people up with jokes and they never learned anything. So it disbanded. He and I have something in common. In Spanish class, I did the exact same thing. Um, I did it in all my classes. So I don't know why you restricted it to Spanish. <laughs> right. But I took um, French. I didn't take Spanish. Um, uh, I'm really curious about the sources here. Obviously, there's reams and reams of Lincoln material. You've probably seen a good percentage of it. I've at least thumbed through some of the stuff that's online. Um Lots of stuff on politics, lots of stuff on, you know, there's a day by day chart of where he yeah. was and when. Um, how much beef is there to chew, to chew on when it comes to the papers that deal with him and immigration? Well, you can chew on it, but you have to find it first. <laughs> lot, so that I, you know, I spent three or four years 
really, this is my first project that I research mostly online, not because I'm lazy, but because there was a lockdown and I had to learn to navigate sources, but it's astonishing how much is online. If you want to get a pamphlet from a German leader who says Lincoln shouldn't run for re-election or he should run, you and they're in English for the most part because they were published in both languages. You can find a lot of stuff. And there are great memoirs by both Irish and German leaders of the um, of the early 50s. And we haven't even gotten to the Civil War yet where the yeah. story turns but, once again. But, you know, Lincoln wrote... He, there were three major things he he spoke in 1858 about uh, Germans and other foreigners being the blood of the blood of the founders of the dec of the country, which is not poisoning the blood; it's blood of the blood. He uh, and he spoke, you know, once when he was charged with nativism during the Lincoln Douglas debates. He said, "No, I want every Hans and Baptiste and Patrick to come to the United States," which is, you know, his way of saying. I guess, Germans, French, and and Irish. And we, we have to, and I point this out during the book, I don't belabor it, but I do, I think you have to acknowledge it. Lincoln's vision of immigration meant European immigration. Ah. In fact, he signed what was called an anti-Cooley bill in 1862 that restricted Chinese immigration on the basis of the fact that Chinese laborers were coming over basically as indentured servants and Liberals thought it was like a uh, reigniting the slave trade. So he signed that. He didn't think about Asians. He certainly didn't think about anyone south of the border. Yeah. Um, and at the same time that he was encouraging Europeans, you know, he was basically offering free Western land to Europeans that Native Americans had lived on. Yeah. And he would, saw no contradiction, no irony in the fact that both of those um, ideals could be held at the same time. Before we get back to the sort of our hero here and before we get back to Lincoln, I do want to ask about you because uh, you've written a lot and I love asking authors about how they come up with their book ideas. Um, the online sources, you mentioned them. And in the book, you seemed a little bit forlorn. Um, they're <laughs> they're easy to find, but you kind of hint that it's not as fun to go through an online catalog. Why? You know, it I had more fun researching my first book than I've ever had because I was writing with two of my best friends, Mark Neely and Gabor Borat. And we went to, we were the book was The Lincoln Image, which is 40 years old this year. And we went to library after library and called up prints and documents and letters. And you had to go through everything. And then there's the aha moments you get. Look at this. Look at that. And the competition among three kind of competitive but friendly uh, guys who are working together. And, you know, I do miss that. I mean, I when we go when I go to research institutions, I go with my wife and I'm not complaining about that. <laughs> She's a great associate researcher like Ina Caro uh, is to Bob Caro. Um, and, you know, I trust her because she knows what I want to find. And and basically everything you do now is you kind of press a button and it's Xerox. It's just different. Yeah. It's better, but it's lonelier. What can I say? Uh, as I mentioned, you've written 56 books. And I'm not saying that to butter you up. It's just the fact of the matter. It's an unbelievable record you've left here. Um, how did your path? And I've read, I can't say all of them. I've read a number of them, um, particularly the newer ones. How did your path from Lincoln and the press to Lincoln and the economy, Lincoln's assassination, um, all the work you've done in talking about Lincoln on CNN and different documentaries, how did how do you put that all together and how did it lead you to this particular idea? Is there a thread you can find other than Lincoln? Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's hard to know. I mean, I think I'm kind of unique. I'm not saying it's an advantageous but it's unique that I have not spent my life in academia or doing one thing. So, you know, I had lots of media experience. I had lots of political experience and government experience in my own life. And I think that does, you know, giving give me insights. I mean, I still hold the New York City record for losing the most elections in the shortest period of time as a press secretary. No one can beat it because it includes... <laughs> Two primaries, a general and a special. That's four in 14 months. No one will ever top that record. I'm Congratulations. So, thank you. Thank you. It's an, it's an asterisk on an asterisk. Well, you can um, make it an asterisk. We can, you can actually just delete it right out if you want. <laughs> I know. I can't. Too many people are still around who remember. <laughs> um, I just had my 75th birthday and three of my oldest political 
friends. My wife's theme was people who've known Harold for 50 years. Wow. And they're still kind of standing. Um, so included a congressman, a, a former New York City controller, and a, a, a political friend who I've known since I was in my 20s. It was, uh -huh. was fun. So the thread is I get an idea. I don't know where they come Was there from. a document that you picked up and you said, this would be good? Was there... You know, I have to say, in 2016, I signed a new contract with a new publisher. I'd been with Simon & Schuster for about um, 10 years. The editor was was kind of slowing down, the wonderful late Alice Mayhew. I'd done three books with her. And I, 2016 was upon us. And what are the two issues that were being discussed intensely? Fake news and immigration. And I really wanted to do immigration first because I thought it was really important. But the battle over the news and the and reporters being bounced out of events and uh, the dichotomy between, let's say, what Fox was reporting and MSNBC was reporting. I just got into that first. I yeah, always you did presidents and the you did Lincoln and the press and then you did presidents, presidents and the press, the press. Yeah, yeah. versus the press. Yeah. And then I came back to immigration. Hey, look, I'm the grandchild of four immigrants. I dedicate this book to my four grandparents, although I only knew one. Um, but she had a big impact on my life because she really wanted to be American. She could never really totally be American because she had a very thick Romanian hmm. Yiddish accent. I don't know what it was. I can still hear it. She's been gone for 60 years. I can still hear the voice. But she really didn't want to. The only thing she liked to read about, well, she didn't read. I didn't know that at the time. She liked to hear about was the the British royal family. She loved royal families because there had been a queen of Romania and she wanted to know about, there was no news about the queen of Romania. So she satisfied herself with Queen Mary. She was a big fan of Queen Mary. So that's what I remember. But she wanted to be American. She wanted to go to establish herself here, even though she kept her religious identity. She wanted to be American. Would Lincoln have appreciated her story? I think so. I mean, you have to take a leap because mostly he, considered women to be appendages of of men but you know she came my grandmother came as an 11 year old and was put to work in a factory by her half sister so she she did have her own story um and yeah i think he appreciated those stories he appreciated that people believed that they could find opportunity only in the united states just as he also believed and this is out of fashion now that america while it was importing people could export democracy he really believed in what we now dismissively refer to as nation building. He believed the Bush in doctrine, the Bush he, doctrine, right? He he did. Uh, and look, who was actually the last president who cared about immigration? Just saying. Right. Um, um, but yes, he did. He he believed that democracy should be exported, that tyrants and and royalty should be overthrown, and democracy put in its place. And he believed that American ideas could would do that. He mm. said it time and time again. Uh, how much, one more about you, and then we'll get back to Lincoln. H how much did this, the current debate about immigration make you either take on this topic and did you have to make yourself brave to take on this topic? Or, or did you say, I really don't know if I want to do this and did someone else have to convince you? No, I wanted to do it. I did not know the topic would be this heated. I mean, thank you, uh, 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 Chuck Schumer and uh, the speaker for screwing up a compromise bill that they worked on for six months so everybody could be mad at everybody else. And there can still be an unchecked border and a and a, what is referred to as a crisis. I'm not going to sure I buy it. But anyway, my point is I just want to remind people about how open and accessible America once was and how we welcome people because, you know, we said one of the things that keeps prices down is to have people working at things that nobody else wants to work at. I don't say that in the book saying it to you. Yeah. Um, and we gave people work permits. We gave people the ability to, to contribute to their families and the economy so they wouldn't be a burden to the taxpayer and they wouldn't be uh, a danger to people. And I don't know, we sort of, I, I know it's not the same America as it was in 1850. I know we have less available land, uh, but I just want, I, I do think it's a service to the current discussion to remind people about how, a, the debate was 
you know, against religious differences as opposed to racial differences today. And it should concern us that we're still in, that the people who oppose immigration are still making bad, um, giving bad reasons for their antipathy. One of the historian's um, warnings that we get on this show is to not do too much drawing of conclusions between what the founders would say about our current sure. topics. Sure. Do you do you counsel that on Lincoln, or do you think there's a lot that can be meshed together? I I listen. You're the one who's drawing me out. I'm making these. Sorry. No, I'm. Yeah, it's the I'm, news I'm, reporter I'm, in me. I promise that in the book. I just let the story unravel. If people want to draw conclusions. And when I do, there is a wonderful quote. It's actually not Lincoln's best writing. And we don't have the text. I think he said it semi-extemporaneously. And the newspapers picked it up either from a manuscript or from stenographers. But he said he was he had offended a German group. They invited him to a July 4th picnic. P-I-C dash N-I-C. I love the way they spell things. And he blew them off, right? Then he realized maybe it was a mistake because he heard, he read that it was a gigantic political opportunity. It was swarming with voters and politicians from Chicago were in there, you know, glad handing. So he gets to give a speech in Chicago right after Independence Day. And he gets up to make the speech and he looks out in the crowd and he sees the guy who was the host of the picnic because he was a gigantic guy named Anton Hessing the leader of the Chicago Germans. And Lincoln looked at him and said, this is, you know, Independence Day, all out, all honor to the founding fathers. Um, and, but I'm looking at this group that has come more recently. And the Declaration of Independence says that you're the blood of the blood of the founders. You can't help. The reader will not be able, to, if, they're, if they remember things that have been said in this current political campaign. I don't say in the book, and I never would say, Lincoln never said that they were poisoning the blood of America, as Donald Trump has said. I just say he said they were the blood of the blood. Let people either think it's relevant or not relevant. I think that kind of openness, that kind of welcoming spirit is relevant to today, even though the country is different. All right. I so he, he's starting from a basic position that new citizens are enriching the country. They're not destroying the country. Uh, let's get back to Lincoln here now fully. Um, so okay. the Whig Party um, is developed. Abraham Lincoln is one of the people in it. Um, explain the impact of immigration on the Whigs and the Whigs' impact on immigration. Well, most historians have attributed the Whigs' indecision about slavery to the demise of the party. <clears throat> but I think its sloppy handling of the immigration situation was another reason why it dissolved. And... Um, you know, the Whigs were kind of elitist. Uh, their argument was, we want everybody to join the elite, but they, a lot of Eastern Whigs drew the line at Irish Catholics, and it messed up the party, and, and it, it, it kind of had contributed to its, its disappearance. And then Lincoln is kind of a man without a party. He's not a know-nothing. He tells his best friend, Josh Speed, how could I be? How could anyone who is fighting for the, you know, better condition for black people be against the advancement of, of classes of white people. Um, he repeat, he loves to say that it sounds a little racist today, but he says it often. And um, finally, there's a new coalition of uh, an anti-slavery coalition that embraces Whigs, uh, former Democrats, new, new anti-slavery people, and a lot of nativists join the new Republican Party because a lot of German nativists particularly are anti-slavery. One of the things you say is that Lincoln sort of, yeah, I mean, kind of tries to have it both ways. Like Absolutely. he doesn't, yeah, I mean, he doesn't, you know, push off the nativists fully, but he no. also doesn't embrace them. No, he's a little too, I mean, he's a little too cozy for comfort. Nobody's perfect, you know, in a 30 year political career. But, you know, he gets, he, he allows a, a group of nativists to come and interview him when he's running for the Senate the first time in 54 and 5. And they talk to him and he says uh, things like, uh, I don't even know what Native uh, Native Americans are. I know that my grandfather was killed by a Native American. And here he's like purposely conflating the term so it could mean American Indian. 
And he walks, he tells a lot of people, there is no such thing as no nothings. It doesn't exist anymore. But then he's accused of going to one of their meetings and he gets really upset and he has people deny it. And I don't believe he ever went to one of their social gatherings. But, you know, he faces Democrats who say Lincoln is against foreigners voting because he really did believe and here he has something in common with modern politician. He lives, politicians, he lives in constant fear of voter fraud. And he thinks that Irish voters are voting illegally. And what makes it even worse, they're voting against him illegally. Right. And I think he over imagines this. He, he sees, if he sees two, he once saw three Irish people at a railroad station. He immediately wrote a letter saying, this has to be stopped. And what are they coming? What are they coming in for? They're coming in just to vote against me. I think we should create a force of agents, you know, detectives to check them out. I mean, that's paranoia. That sounds, and it sounds familiar. It does, doesn't it? Again, <laughs> yeah. I don't make odious comparisons. But yeah, I mean, there's always been fear of voter fraud in America. And then, then the Irish are trying to stop the Germans from voting. The Germans are trying to stop the Irish from voting. It's kind of a big brawl. And people did not vote secretly in those days. They voted in... You know, they picked up a ballot. If you picked up a blue ballot, you were voting Republican. If you picked up a yellow ballot, you were voting. It's different everywhere, but that's the, the color thing. And then you walked in your party line. You walked in the Republican line or the Democratic line, and you put the ballot in a giant fishbowl. There was no secret ballot. So these battles are taking place in the streets, in newspapers, on debate stages. It's kind of fun. I, I was have. just going to say, it sounds more fun than the way we do it today. I know. You, know, you go in today, you're all hushed, and you go in quietly, and I, I mark my paper. Super know, don't early. look. Don't look. There's a... But the other thing is that um, um, people were open about, very open about their party affiliations. But we can blame Lincoln for mail-in ballots, okay? It was Lincoln's. Lincoln came up with that idea in 1864. Why should all these soldiers who probably like me not vote. We either have to furlough them and send them home, which they did, by the way, a lot of cases, or let them vote absentee in army camps. One thing I love about Lincoln is he's good at politics all the way through. All no to the very or, last day. Um, uh, uh, do we know, is it possible to figure out what the immigrant vote, uh, how it broke down in 1860? Can we figure that out? How much support did he get? Very hard. And and historians have been battling back and forth for a generation or more. The Germans won him this state or that state. They didn't. They weren't. I mean, it's kind of hard because, um, you know, the, the Democratic Party's uh, split made it very likely that Republicans were going to win the Western states. But the Germans certainly, you know, they were Democratic in 1856, but they rallied to the Republicans. And then four years later, they were where Lincoln thought it might be a close election until until Atlanta was taken. The Germans were a really important force. First, they were going to they were going to start a third party with John C. Fremont. That was a German effort. It's never talked about as such. It's talked about, you know, a, a radical uh, Republican effort because Lincoln was too slow on ending slavery in border states like Missouri, where there are a lot of Germans. But if you look at the people who went to that convention to nominate Fremont in May of 1864, they were something like 70% German. Lincoln very famously begins to realize as the Civil War goes on that Black soldiers can make a big, big difference if they are to fight for the Union, right. both politically and militarily. How did he start to bring immigrant fighters into the fold? Well, he did so before he brought Black fighters in. He held his, you know, he held that valuable tool to himself for, for two and a half years. But as soon as Fort Sumter fell, there were rallies around the country in immigrant heavy cities, most famously Union Square in New York City. A uh, hundred thousand people attended that rally. Just think of what that crowd was in 1860, one terms. It was huge. And German and Irish speakers rose one after another and said, I didn't vote for Lincoln, but he's our president. As soon as they assaulted our flag in Charleston, that was our flag. And an Irishman gets up and says, this is worse than if the British came. You know, the fact that the slaveholders and the disunionists came. And Lincoln makes a huge effort to get ethnic, so-called ethnic colonels and generals to raise regiments. Franz Sigel, the German in the West, 
um, he lets his um, ambassador designate to Spain, Carl Schwartz, start a regiment. He fails, but he, he and then later he comes back from Spain and joins the war, war effort. And I found a memorandum. I mean, other people have found, I've seen it. There's a memorandum where Lincoln writes three names on a piece of paper. Michael Corcoran, Thomas Francis Marr, and James Shields. And apparently that's the list of top Irish recruiting agents and officers. And Archbishop John Hughes, the highest ranking prelate in the Catholic Church in this country, apparently said, that's the list, Mr. President. And he got every one of them to serve. And it was a big lift for, for, for him to reach out to Shields because Shields was an old political enemy from Illinois who had once challenged him to a duel. Because Lincoln and Mary had written some anti-Irish, you know, satires against him. And and yet he, and by the way, all of those generals were not successful. Eth I can't think of a single ethnic general who was a huge success in the war. Um, but they served a very big purpose. 200,000 Germans enlisted. Yeah, I was going to ask how many, yeah. And about 140,000 Irish. And that's not counting... Swedes, Brits, Hungarians, Italians. We had a Garibaldi guard in New York that was and, an ethnic. And why did they serve? Did they have a real feeling for the ideals of the country? I, you know, reading the papers of the soldiers, you get a sense that the Irish were very aroused about the assaults on the country in the beginning. And later, some of them wanted a secure job and, and the the armed services paid more than menial factory jobs. You know, they became disenchanted later over the fear of black uh, uh, migration to the North for further competition. Germans were anti-slavery. They couldn't wait to serve. And it, you know, it is a remarkable thing to think about that, that it was a multi-ethnic army. In 18... 23% of the Union Army was foreign born. And another 20% was first generation born wow. in the United States. That's half of the army. You know, some magazine editor I know, uh, a wonderful guy named Dana Schof, um, called it Lincoln's Foreign Legion. So I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is give him credit on your podcast, and then I'm gonna steal it from here on in because there you go. There you go. Uh in 1864. Abraham Lincoln gives a really remarkable, well, he gives several remarkable speeches in 1864, but there's one that you focus on, um, which is the annual message that he gives to Congress in December, uh, on December 6th. Of course, he doesn't give it the way they give it today. Right. It was written, but he said, and I'm going to quote it, and then you can reflect on it. He said, I regard our emigrants as one of the principal replenishing streams appointed by Providence to repair the ravages of internal war and its wastes of national strength and health. How much of a firm statement is that? And what does that tell you about the evolution that he went on from his time of not taking a position on it, at least too loudly, to this joint, you know, to a message to Congress? Well, he had, I, in the previous annual message, he had gone farther than further, I should say, Got it. I always mix those. It's two. a Marx Brothers joke. Is anything farther, further, right? <laughs> right. Um, I'm speaking to you from four blocks from where Groucho Marx was born. Oh, Just saying. I'll He's be born on 78th Street in Manhattan. I'm on 74th Street. I used to live a block from where Groucho was born, um, which should be marked by a plaque. Um, in, in the previous annual message, Lincoln had proposed the most radical pro-immigration idea in the history of the United States. He proposed, and he said in the 63 message, we need people for the army, we need people for factories, for farms, and mines. He said the government should pay for the ocean passages of immigrants. And the reaction was, I mean, people were alarmed. They were horrified, mostly. That's a bridge too far. Um, it'll bring us the refuse of the, you know, the dregs of Europe, it's pretty ugly. Even the progressive newspapers, I mean, the Lincoln administration paper said it. But they did reform immigration. They created the first federal bureau. They built up the um, the landing depots at Castle Garden in lower Manhattan. They offered to build new ones in Boston, Philadelphia, and New Orleans. And um, 
They offered to extend the Homestead Act to foreigners, meaning free land in the West if you worked it. And they worked out a kind of, they encouraged private industry to advance money for ocean passages for Europeans. Lincoln did not just need men in the army at that point. Be remember, in in 60, the end of 63, beginning of 64, there must have been 400,000 of the 750,000 casualties already dead. That's a lot of people. That's like 10, 12 million today. So they needed not only replenishment from the army, but help on farms and in jobs that these, and that's not even counting the injured. These people are never going to go back to those manual labor jobs. They right. desperately needed people. So that was a unique situation. And he didn't get what he really wanted. But by 64, as you point out, by late 64, he's saying something even more radical. He's saying that when he says that appointed by Providence, he's saying that God wants immigrants to come to the United States. And remember, just really three three months, four months later, he's saying that if God wills that this war continue until every drop of blood drawn with a lash is repaid by one drawn with a sword, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. People forget that he said the same thing about immigration, that Providence has but does, does, has assigned us to welcome more people to replenish the ravages of war and internal strife. I love internal strife because um, we still got internal strife. Yeah, you think uh, yeah. there is a. Uh, I, I was floored reading the fact that the person who shot John Wilkes Booth dead, Thomas Corbett, was an immigrant. Uh, you know how important is that to the story of Lincoln well, and to the story of America? He was a British immigrant commanded not so well by an Irish colonel, Irish-born colonel. Um, he, uh, his One of his conspirators was born in Germany. They were hanged by a first-generation German. Lincoln died in a boarding house that was owned by a German, uh, a German-born uh, a tailor, William Peterson. Uh, yeah, th this country spoke with a foreign accent in the 1860s. It was part of our culture. And it is amazing that the, uh, the the multicultural extent of diversity during the Civil War. Not so much in the South, of course. Immigrants tended to come North because there was more opportunity. It was more elastic economic society in the North than the kind of fixed aristocracy of the South. Although there were plenty, you know, there were immigrants who fought for the Confederacy and lived in the Confederacy. But uh, yeah, the, the Boston Corbett story is amazing, right? Unbelievable. Yeah. And I didn't, and I've read it, literally dozens of books about Lincoln. You've written dozens. Um, how how could I have missed that all this time? An immigrant shot John Wilkes Booth. An immigrant shot him. And when the other conspirators were hanged, I should have included that that grisly photograph of the hanging. Actually, a series of photographs was taken by Alexander Gardner, and he was from Scotland. Hmm. As was Alan Pinkerton, the detective who probably saved Lincoln's life. Right. Route to Washington for his inauguration. So they are everywhere in our society in this period. What did immigrants say after Lincoln's death? Was there a reflection that this person stood for us? We are devastated that he is gone. I think they reflected a generally very um, um, uh, mournful and devastated, as you say, there's no better word, response. Thomas Francis Marr, the Irish general, stood at the edge of Lincoln's coffin, standing guard when his remains were in, lying in state in New York City. Um, the Irish joined the, the parades for the Lincoln funeral in New York, although, you know, some, some critical voices were heard. It's typical, you know, once, once he paid the ultimate sacrifice, the political divisions were forgotten. Only a few months before he died, Lincoln only 30% of the vote in New York City, the largely Catholic, Irish Catholic vote voted against him, as they had in 1860. So, uh, yeah, um, martyrdom ends hostility. And I think it was a universal mourning, um, the, the Germans and the Irish particularly. If you could pull, African if you could pull something out of Lincoln's, uh, the writings that he left on immigration, um, something out of his political behavior, um, and apply it to the way people treat and discuss immigrants today in our political system and in our everyday life, what would it be? I think it would be, and this is particularly 
useful because it's the one quote we haven't <laughs> dealt with in our talk. It was probably be the time that Lincoln was speaking to a crowd in Cincinnati, a very German city, on the way to his inaugural. And they had come to rally and pledge their allegiance to him. And he said, I promise that I will never place anything in the way of people coming to America to enjoy the liberty that you enjoy and I enjoy. And um, I think that I think he kind of lived up to that promise, both in the platforms that he endorsed in 1860 and 64 that called for open immigration and in the reforms that he introduced in 1863 and that were passed in 64 and then right after he died in 60 in 65 um there was not another immigration enhancement bill passed in this country for 100 years until Lyndon Johnson uh wrote a, an immigration expansion bill and got it through congress in 1965 hmm. and there hasn't been one since so those those reforms are Hard to hard to create. Many it's all restrictions mostly. Many ask. Um, it's become a very common question over the last five or eight, ten years, but really probably since Lincoln died. Um, if Lincoln hadn't died, what would have been the impact on Reconstruction and thus American racism? My question is: If he hadn't died, what would the impact have been on our nation's treatment of migrants? I mean, the Chinese Exclusion Act was twenty years later. Yeah, yeah. You know, again, I think Lincoln believed in keeping America as a welcoming destination. You know, he believed in um uh the the tenets of uh, Emma Lazarus before Emma Lazarus wrote the poem, give us your poor and your tired the wretched refuse yearning to breathe free. He really believed in the portal of opportunity. Um, so I think he would, you know, it's all speculation, it's all counterfactual, but he probably would have continued on that path because what he wanted to do was build industry, build agriculture, and the post-war generation that was coming out of the military was pretty hobbled, literally hobbled. You know, there were amputees, there were people who had typhoid that they couldn't get rid of, uh, lung disease, and it, it was... It took a generation for the American worker to, to you know, be productive enough to push us into the Gilded Age. I'm going to ask a naughty question, especially to a guy who's written 56 books. Have you? Do you have any idea if there will be another one or what you would do next after this? You know, it's very interesting. Not only did I have a milestone birthday recently, but during this project, my editor um, at uh, Dutton left and my agent retired and was replaced by someone who was let go. So I now have no publisher, no editor, and no agent. So I think I'm going to let myself feel liberated for a couple of weeks, <laughs> a couple, of, couple of weeks. And yeah. then I'll have a project in mind and I'll, you know, see if there's a, a market out there for an idea. I'd still like to write the definitive book about how Lincoln not conspired, what's the word, uh, worked with the the picture industry and artists and sculptors in particular to advance his political success and ensure his place in history. I think that I've, I've, I've written about it around the periphery, mainly about Prince, when I started writing about Lincoln in, in books 40 years ago. But he was really, for a guy who was so humble about his own appearance, he spent a lot of time posing you know, for, for painters and sculptors in Springfield, in the White House, for statues, for portraits, for history paintings. This guy knew, I mean, you know, it's, it's, we have the President Trump spent all of his time tweeting, and we thought that was kind of a waste of time. But you know what, it was really, I, I credit Trump in my last book as one of the four or five best communicator presidents we've ever had, because he mastered an entirely new um, communications medium and China dominated it for a long time. And I think that was true of Lincoln. He saw the possibility of the picture industry in extending sympathy and uh, uh, the blessings of a good reputation. So that I, you see, now you've got me, I'm writing a proposal, but that's the one thing I think I have left unless something else strikes me. 
Did I, did I ever tell you why I wrote the Cooper Union book? No, which, by the way, was one of the first books I read about Lincoln. Oh, great. So I'm sitting in Gettysburg with my former editor, Alice Mayhew. And we're there because we're honoring both David Donald and Doris Goodwin, both of whom worked for, for Alice Mayhew. And I'm sitting next to her at the dinner. And she turns to me, this is like 2001. She says to me, yeah, it is 2001, I think. It's actually the, the right after Bush v. Gore. It's kind of a funny time. She turns to me and she says, you know, I'm so proud of the Lincoln books. I'm putting out these books about Lincoln speeches. I did Gary Wills, Lincoln at Gettysburg. I did Ron White, Lincoln's Greatest Speech. And now I just signed Alan Gelzo to write Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. And in a flash in my head, I thought, what am I going to say? You know, this happens in a flash of a second. Yeah. I can either say, you ignorant woman, the Emancipation Proclamation wasn't a speech. Or I can say, I have an idea too. And fortunately for me, I said, Alice, what about Lincoln at Cooper Union? She said, what do you mean? I said, it's the speech that made Lincoln president. She said, send me a proposal. So you never know when it's going to strike, is what I'm saying. I need somebody to say something that upsets me, and then I'll have an idea. Well, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, and I guess it's about the same time. Well, yeah, it would have been 2003. My dad, you know, I grew up in New York and lived there and, of course, loved New York. My dad and I went down to Cooper Union to read out loud the um, book written, I forget, the, uh, the Manchester book on Kennedy's last oh. day. And we went and read that aloud from from what I remember, at least, was the podium that Lincoln stood from at Cooper Union. And that was a really cool way to experience history and know that I was touching the same podium and it is amazing that the it's same just, lectern. It's just sitting there and it's used by speakers today. And the room is the same room. I mean, it's 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 aligned and designed differently, mm. uh, faces a different direction. But yeah, uh, uh, I was I proud to do that. Union. I went to Cooper Union as a very young man uh, with my cousin who went, who was a student at Cooper Union at the time. He's now 91, 92 years old. And he took me when I was a kid to, to Cooper Union. Harold Holzer, the author of Brought Forth on This Continent, Abraham Lincoln and American Immigration. Thank you so much for being here. Evan, thanks. I hope Check. it's not another four years. <laughs> you got it. Check out the, you got, but you got to write another book. Well, maybe I'll do another one of your previous books. We can do Cooper Union if you want. Um, check out the book. Check out his website, haroldholzer.com. He's on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Harold Holzer. I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axel Bank Reports, History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axel Bank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. See you next time. Thanks. <laughs>